It's time for Twig This Week at Google. Aunt Prude has the week off. Jeff Jarvis, Stacey Higginbotham are here. We are, because they are journalists, going to talk about journalism and what Facebook has revealed about the number one most popular COVID-19 post on the platform at the beginning of this year. Uh, the answer might surprise you. OnlyFans says, yeah, we like sex. They're bringing it back. We'll also talk about Airbnb. It's the new WeWork. It's all coming up next on This Week in Google. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Twig, This Week in Google, episode 626, recorded Wednesday, August 25th, 2021. Clowns, mimes, and robots. This Week in Google is brought to you by CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike harnesses the power of every click, every action, and every ally to grow stronger and stop cyber threats before they can stop you. Join the fight and experience the power of Falcon Platform for free today at CrowdStrike.com slash twit. And by Compiler, an original podcast from Red Hat, discussing tech topics, big, small, and strange. Listen to Compiler on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. It's time for Twig This Week at Google, the show where we cover the latest news from Google and, <laughs> and Point South. Uh, joining us uh, all the way up in the north, from the Pacific Northwest, Stacy Higginbotham of StacyOnIoT.com. Hi, Stace. Hello, y'all. You're having a nice big bowl of soup, Cheerios, Captain Crunch. What was that? It is it was delicious corn and basil pasta from Ooh. the New York Times. I was like, oh my gosh, this is delicious and easy. I have to make that. It's in the New York Times. Good. You do. I shall it's, get it. Yeah. Cor corn, nice. basil, pasta. Do it while the corn is fresh and the basil is fresh. Now is the time. We have a little basil plant in the kitchen. Every once in a while, we'll get go to Trader Joe's and get the plant and just... Basically, it's eviscerate it until it's gone. <laughs> it's cruel, but uh, it's a cruel world for basil. That's all I can say. That's Jeff Jarvis. He is in Florida this week visiting dad. Light a candle for me, people. Light a candle for me. <laughs> Buzzmachine.com. And, of course, Jeff is officially the Leonard Tao Professor for Journalistic Innovation at the Craig Newmark Graduate Craig, School of Journalism. Craig. It's hard to do it without I'm Ant here. At the City it University is. of it New is. York. Ant has the week off. He's vacationing, as one does in in August. Not oh, all of us. Good for Ant. Yeah, he needs a little time off. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> da, 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 da. Um, I guess we should do this. I, I you know, it's funny uh, because I don't use Facebook. I don't. I often eschew the Facebook stories, just because they don't ma they don't matter to me. But I guess they might matter to other people, so I think we should probably do them. They matter to Jeff. They matter to Jeff. No. Well, sometimes it matters that we don't do them just because Leo's going to yell at me. But no, go no, ahead. No, this one I have no, uh, I've literally no opinion on. Actually, it's, I'll tell you, it is kind I of do. interesting. Okay, I thought you might. So Facebook says that it was really one post that cast out on the vaccine that was the most popular in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, this after a long struggle over whether to share the data at all with the public. But here's the thing that's fascinating, and I think it's the reason probably Facebook shared it. The article... Or, which, did, or didn't share it at first because they knew what crap would ensue, but go ahead. Well, okay, this is interesting. Um, this The uh, article was... Uh, seen by um, t was it 2.8 billion people? Oh no, that's the Facebook's total user no. count. So that's no. confusing. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's confusing. Remember last, the, the most popular things were seen by like 0.01 percent. But keep yeah. going. It was um, uh, the most shared, the top performing link in the United States on its platform, January through March. But it was from a legitimate news organization, the South Florida Sun Sentinel. It was distributed by the Chicago Tribune. Which and, owns the Sun Sentinel. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was a completely legitimate journalistic story about the CDC investigating the death of a doctor who passed away two weeks after getting the coronavirus vaccine. Um, now, months after this was widely shared on Facebook, the medical examiner's office found 
that there was not enough evidence to say whether the vaccine had played a role in the doctor's death. You know, people die whether they get the vaccine or not. It's not necessarily cause and effect. However, it was, I think it's safe to say, shared, widely shared on Facebook as evidence that the vaccine kills. Well, I shared it with people. I, I showed it to people. It was it was a, an uh-oh story in any case, and it was early in the vaccine days. Uh, but it was, as you just said, it was that you shared health misinformation, Jeff Jarvis. Well, that's exactly the point is that where is that line and how do you decide this is misinformation? So the story of the Facebook report got presented as Facebook didn't reveal information about the most popular thing on the platform being vaccine misinformation. And then it was buried in all the media stories that this was a story from the Chicago Tribune company. Uh, they say well, we'll it, take down outright false information, but con but they argue conversations about factual articles yeah, shouldn't be suppressed, right? Up and people were perfectly legitimate to be curious about it and read it and share it. There's no there's no issue there, Stacy. And I'm curious, Jeff, what you think about this. But I feel like media right now we're in this weird era where we don't know how to deal with stories that change over time. So if we think about like the scientific Amen. uncertainty around COVID. You know, it's one thing when we used to have, you know, you printed it on paper and then it was thrown away. And so you could change that and people, it was harder to go back and look for stuff, right? You know, you were a universal source of truth, you and your morgue with all your clips, right? But now right. we put stuff out there, it gets shared out of the context of the date or whatever. Uh, we're learning new things. We don't necessarily update everything. So how do we do journalism when things can be ripped from the context? How do we try to, I well, really don't know. This is a conversation I had with the doctors and scientists I, I interviewed out of my COVID list in the early days of the platform. And I asked them just this question. And the problem that I've learned about journalism, and I, I was guilty of this in my day, and I've said this I think, on the show before, is that we take the latest word as the last word. There's a new study that says coffee will kill you. And then a week later, coffee will save your life. Right. And we never put it in the context. We don't understand the process of science. And it's not just the process of science. We don't understand the process of politics. Like, look at the look at the coverage of Nancy Pelosi. Oh, my God, she's lost. Oh, she won. Look at the process about the, the withdrawal from from Afghanistan. Oh, it's a, it's a horrible thing. Oh, we got 80,000 people out. And and um, we want to declare, you know, that this line that we write the first draft of history means we ignore history. We ignore context. We report the here and now. And surely we should have learned better than that by now, but we haven't. Journalism is awful at reporting process, whether that process is that of learning in science. We should have warned everybody, we don't know what the COVID, vaccine, or COVID virus is yet. We don't know what it's going to do. And responsible journalists did at Stat News. Uh, really good reporters there, Helen Bramswell, people like that really explain this. Kai Kupferschmidt is a great scientific reporter out of Germany uh, who writes for science. There are some very good examples, but there are also tons of terrible examples. And, and just this story kind of illustrates that, right? It was one episode, one thing, one fact that in and of itself doesn't teach you anything, but is of interest. It is of legitimate interest and legitimate for explanation and discussion and and, and the funny thing about this one is the reason I think Leo did the story is because it's not about media at the time, nor is it about Facebook at the time. It's more a story about media's reaction now because they wanted to go after Facebook and oops, turned out to not be the best <laughs> um, uh, indictment of them. Facebook spokesperson Andy Stone said it considered making the report public earlier. But since we knew the attention it would gather exactly as we saw this week, there were no there were fixes to the system we wanted to make. They didn't say what those fixes were. Um, <laughs> you got to think that Facebook must have wanted to make this public because it really does kind of thumb its nose at this criticism. That well, except, but Leo, look at the look at the coverage that came out of the New York Times and the Washington Post. They buried the fact that it was legitimate. Report. Oh, interesting. Okay. It wasn't until the next round of reporting that said, oh, uh, big guys, you kind of buried the lead there. This was a legit it, article. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you yeah. can't, you, you, no one, I don't think at this point could say Facebook should have blocked that, right? No, absolutely not. If they did, they would have gotten holy hell. Right. But that's, they, no matter what they do, they get holy hell. Now, I think Facebook handled this badly. That's usually my preamble in talking about Facebook stuff these days. They're not as bad as they're screaming, but they could have done a lot better. Right? They could have released this report and used it as an opportunity to say, look, folks, this is process. This was legitimate media. 
you can't knock us for doing this. Yes, it was popular because people were talking about had, this and they were scared. Now, what let me do you ask about a question media? of both of you. Had the article been published in, let's say, the Epic Times, which has been very aggressively, you know, anti-vaccine, they're a Falun Gong-sponsored kind of uh, less than credible source. Had it come from, the flu, from those guys with the same set of facts, would that have it's changed? Stacey, what do you think? Um, yes, I tend to, actually the first thing that came to my mind when you mentioned that it was, uh, uh the Sun Sentinel, I was like, is that a Sheldon Addison paper? Right, right. Is that legit or not? <laughs> but that's a good question. Exactly. That's what everybody should ask. That's what your daughter should ask. What's the source, right? So, so yes, the source does actually matter, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, yet the facts, if the facts are the same, the facts are the facts, uh, I guess you could say the article may have uh, used them to uh, advance I mean, yes, an agenda. Yes, you, you can say advance an agenda. Like I actually, I was tweeting about this, but I'm I'm seriously, I'm thinking about volunteering slash taking over my local paper because. Whoa, 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 whoa. Back into leads. Speaking of backing into leads. What is the, wait, 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 wait. Stacy. Pulitzer Higginbotham, Stacey Randolph Hearst Higginbotham. No, What's going with me? No, I'm just no, 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 I'm no, no, frustrated. Or more, more like, who is Roger Ailes' wife who took off her their local paper because she didn't like? Yes, her exactly. Coming. I'm like, oh, God, I'm be like Roger. Ailes. No, no. This is this is just as a journalist living in a place, and I have there's an island newspaper, and it's it's not a bad newspaper. I just I'm not getting. It's very much. The loudest person driving it. There are very few facts and a lot of opinions. Boy, some good journalism in a local newspaper. What a concept! Well, no, and I don't. I, I know, want you again, to do this, Stacey. I would love. Oh, I'll kick in this. ten grand I, to to help you do oh, this. No, 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 no I'm not gonna. I'm, I'm just gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna start by seeing if they'll let me write for them and maybe cover go. something. Um, because I have an actual job too. But I, I'm just like, as I look at this, this but is. You're an actual journalist. And this guy is an actual journalist. The guy who runs the paper is an actual journalist. I think he's probably, he's like all one person. He's like a one man newspaper. He's like I.F. Right? Stone That's, kind of. Yeah, well, or like. Or Nosy Neighbor or Gladys Kravitz. More like, more Gladys like Kravitz. Yeah, whoever, pick, pick your favorite small town newspaper who's got like a part time photographer and is probably picturing a grizzled old man who you know, runs around all over the place or anyway. Yeah, but we all loved I.F. Stone much to cover. when he did that because he was, well, we all, we lefties loved it because he was progressive. I'm sure yeah. there were plenty of people on the other side who said, this, this crackpot this who has his newspaper is driving us yeah. crazy. <laughs> and I think, I think actually if I report things with less, we have a real issue on the island with, um, Big nimbyism, big opinions. Sure, Everything sure. is like yeah. evil. I yeah. mean, there's it's very polarized. So I, I'm wondering if I can put facts first and then like he leads with the most inflammatory quote, right? Well, he Always. probably has some experience on what sells newspapers in Bainbridge Island. Well, well. exactly. So I'm like, <laughs> he this, might, this may he be might all for nothing. be a good businessman <laughs> as opposed to a... Exactly. <laughs> so, in, yes. So I'm, I'm going to just see what I can do here and maybe I won't be able to do anything. I'm not going to like take over the paper. I mean, maybe I'm not no, no, no. I, I think you are. You're going to. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. What would you I need these know. days? Seriously, what would you need to do? Uh, first of all, I guess a print newspaper is a recipe for disaster. They have a web. They have a local, a, it's local print web, and web. It's on the yeah, web. Yeah, I mean, it, this serves 20... The island has a population of 24,000 people. Right. So... I mean, this is, and it's part of it's a chain. Local. A, Perfect, hyper local. It is, yeah. It's always been my fantasy to do that with a radio station because that's my, that's the medium I know, uh, and to have a because yeah. radio stations have become less and less local, more and more uh, nationalized, and all right. broadcasting the same stuff. And I think small town newspapers and small town radio stations are vital. Uh, not that anybody would ever listen to a pedal of a radio. I have station. a vision. If you want, if you want that vision of the small town paper, if it, there was a there was a great episode of the Twilight Zone called Printer's Devil, in which Burgess Meredith played the devil as a watch out for this linotype operator, <laughs> and and what he typed into the linotype affect uh, changed the future. So this is my vision for Stacy: is that she becomes the all powerful 
um, uh, print mogul of the island. What would you do, Stacy, to keep yourself from becoming that which you currently abhor? Ah. Wow, I don't abhor, like, I mean, I abhor, like, super, I don't abhor the local paper. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, maybe I'm overstating it. Uh, I'm like, good Lord. <laughs> but but you, you, want, you have some curative purpose in mind, yes? I do. I, well, I think I would, I would lead with the facts. Right now, he's lead leading with the, with the most. And if you did that, I mean, do you think that would protect you down the road from becoming an advocate? I do. So here's the deal. It's very easy for me in the tech world because I can be an advocate. I am a consumer advocate yes. when I think about and, and I'm I'm totally comfortable with that. Yes. If I am reporting on city council, especially at the local level, I can't report for consumers because, you know, it, it, it's meaningless for that. And I can't say, you know, I'm pro, you know, pro environmentalism because then, you know, the thing is you're anti-development. But really what I want to do, I mean, I want to do, I want to straddle the middle that I try to straddle here and bring the nuance to each of these ideas. And this is probably terrible for journalism. The reason I ask is it feels like it would be hard not to have some mission creep where, um, you, so, so, and I admire both of you as real journalists who are able to put their feelings aside and do good journalism. And I'm I'm always fascinated by how you kind of keep on the straight and narrow with that. You have to recognize that there's no such thing as objective reporting. Like yes, who gets placed that's right. and where. Even even so the as decision long as you to know cover that. a story is uh, an editorializing in some way. So you know, but I I do think there's room for improvement in things like our city council debates right. and. So you can't. Yeah, so we'll see. You can't ever. It's a. It's a. It's a. Specious to say that there is a perfect center that where you you can't do that. It's worse than that. There's there's a yeah. wonderful, and I think I've mentioned the show before, but I have only so many things to mention. Um, uh, Op-ed in the New York Times by Wesley Lowry, Pulitzer Prize winning Washington Post reporter who left the Post because he disagreed with the editor about social media and the idea of objectivity. And he argues that, that objectivity is a power structure and power structures That's come right. from race. And it, That's right. White person is the editor in charge who looks like me who says That's, right. That's objective and that's biased. That's, that's right. And you can't cover that because you have that bias. Um, so that's a power uh, relationship. And, it, and he said, and so this is, I just it's, spent In other words, it's impossible. Uh, it's impossible not to have that in some way. I argue. Right. And you can be aware further, of it. Yeah, certainly awareness. Oh yes, and you and, and, and you be transparent about it, uh, but also it's also about uh, valuing lived experience. Uh, Lewis Raven Wallace, who's a trans journalist who got fired from NPR because he wouldn't toe that line, says that when they fired him, they lost his experience, they lost his perspective. That's right. They told him that no, you can't cover these things because you're biased. Well, the other way to look at this is who better to cover this because of your experience? And it's a who bias to, to say you can't cover this is a bias. Exactly. So exactly. This is, but you know, this is that um, famous risk of situational ethics. Yes. But I think the argument is all ethics are situational. Is that kind of what you're saying? Um, there's so there's yeah. the, no, not the, the, all ethics. People who oh. use the phrase <laughs> situational ethics use it to to kind of say, well, there there is an actual ethical truth, and then there are people who hedge it because they say, well, the situation means that you can't adultery is okay here and but but are you saying that so you say sounds like stacy you do believe that there is a uh an ethical truth that uh i think you should attempt to report an ethical truth like yeah. that is what i try to do i recognize that you know there are probably more than two sides to lots of issues yeah. there are sides that are worth highlighting there are sides like random troll guy that probably does not get right. highlighted you know and you would agree yes, with I ask myself in our chat room that yeah. the effort alone is worthy yeah and you're never going to get it all perfect right i mean that's the other thing and with community journalism and community like local news a journalist is very much part of the community you can't be objective about that's the true. place where you live yeah so you know, you've got to be the type of person who's willing to meet people where they're at and like, 
be a part of that community and that will influence your coverage. We're actually very fortunate in Petaluma, a town of a little larger than Bainbridge Island, about 50,000. <laughs> well, not a lot larger, but, you know, twice the size, that we have a local paper, the Argus Courier, which is uh, run by the, the big city paper, the Santa Rosa Press Democrat, which is owned by the really big city paper, the New York Times Company. Um, but I... And uh, not anymore. Not anymore? Did they get... Did they divest? divest? Yeah. I don't know who owns it then. But um, they've done a really good job. I, I feel very fortunate that we have a small town paper because they do... A, 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 they talk... They cover the, the city council meetings. They cover the controversies in the town. And they take letters to the editor that say things like, you're so full of it, which is great. Um... I feel very fortunate, but I have a feeling there are a lot of towns in this country that don't have anything like that. Who's going to cover the city council meetings? God, they're well, so boring slash crazy. Yeah. But Stacey, you know, because we know how Stacey thinks on this show, she's going to come at this and say, have you thought of this angle? Uh, we should really discuss this part of it. Uh, here's a different perspective that you should see. I mean, that's what's going to be really valuable. Oh, you're right. We were uh, we were bought by something called Sonoma Media Investments. Uh, after Halifax Media bought it from... Um, from the oh, Times Company? Uh, uh, Times. Yep. That's a group of old white guys. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're Sonoma Media Investments. But yeah, right. Actually, they look like middle-aged white guys. Sometimes white My guys bad. can... Yeah, there's a... Yeah. Sometimes they can do a good job. Um, anyway, I think they are... They, 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 I think they are doing it. They bought the, the Press Democrat, the Argus Courier, the North Bay Business Journal from Halifax. That's right. How would you know that, Jeff? I Google. Oh, you Googled it. <laughs> I was so impressed. He's a journalist. He looks up facts. Oh, I, I knew, I knew um, it was okay. sold. Well, here I am living in the town where five years ago or something, the Times sold it off but uh, and didn't even pay attention. But I have to say, there, it's... Um, I would love. To, I know that's what Craig Newmark's all about, right? Is 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 trying to preserve this this tradition of journalism. Um, well, yeah, preserve what's worth preserving, but also challenge what's not worth preserving and make it better. I mean, Craig pushes for trust in news, and I think he recognizes that that too often we've lost it, and that's what I recognize too. Yeah. So my sister is, is we're in my father's apartment right now, and she just brought me. She's going starting to go through his stuff as we as we pack up what's necessary for him. And she just came across this. Take five on page five daily with Jeff Jarvis, the man with the beard. Is that the, what is that the Examiner? That was the Examiner. That's a yep. little bus card that uh, or a subway yep. card. Yep. In fact, it's still got the curve from being on the bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah so <laughs> that's, awesome. The, that's awesome. That's awesome. Closet. On the in the San Francisco Muni. Back when the Examiner was not a rag, yeah. Now it it's a, a real newspaper. Now it's a giveaway. It's a, a gimme yeah. newspaper. It's not. I don't. I think. I don't know. Obviously, yeah. I'm not up on local media anymore. Um, but, but obviously not. San Francisco used to have a morning paper, the Chronicle, and an afternoon paper, the Examiner, and they were arch rivals, and they were both great. And they had columnists like Jeff Jarvis. It was Herb Kane. Herb Kane, the legendary Herb Kane. I miss that. Mm. And they, by the way, they probably had Sudoku puzzles, both of them. <laughs> God bless them. Hey, speaking of uh, journalism, uh, our favorite uh, uh, columnist, Zainab Tufiki, has joined the New York Times as an opinion columnist. Congratulations to uh, Zainab. Um, and the Times. And the Times. I think she's, I've been kind of a religious reader of her opinion pieces, both in the Times and the Atlantic, because she was the first person, as the Times points out, to tell people in March of 2020, you know, masks might actually be a good idea. Back when the Surgeon General was saying, don't wear masks, save them for the medical personnel. Well, um, that's, a, that's a question, though. I wonder whether when, so, when the history is written, presumably we all survived to write it, I wonder whether... Um, we might find out that that was a strategy just to save the masks for the doctors who needed them. Oh, it was. It was. But what they should have said is don't wear N95, don't wear medical quality masks. But you know what? That mask you make yourself is better than nothing. But it's, even at the time, doctors were dying to get any kind of mask because they had no PPE. Well, so, but, I, but I think you know, of, uh, I think it was Croatia where they started an on-the-ground effort to get all the grannies to sew masks and they would keep them on the streets on mask trees for anybody to take. It had a huge impact on the spread of the virus 
We could have we could have done that. And by the way, but the this Times is an point, points out that a month later the CDC reversed itself, because partly because they said one senior scientist at the agency said Zainab's essay was key to that decision. Oh, oh. So she had some. Yeah, this, one, this goes back to what Stacey was talking about before, and you were talking about too. Is the process we didn't know, we legitimately didn't know at the time. And um, and as evidence came out, and as people like to say they talked about this, uh, it was reexamined, and the opinions changed uh, based on different evidence and data, not based purely on emotions. So and you, we've talked about the, the idea that you know maybe it would be best if you have a COVID nineteen uh, Twitter list, which is made up of epidemiologists and physicians, people who are experts in the field. Yes. And and I think you've always made the case that those are the people who we should listen to, and and we should really be careful about listening to people not like sociologists who are not experts in the field. But there or is journalists. Or, or journalists. journalists. But I think there is, and this is where journalism has an important role. That's what a journalist can say is, you know, exactly. there's a lot of different opinions, even in the medical community. Here's a summary of them and yeah. why yes. it's you can't make a decision based on. Uh, that's a that's a good role, for, right, Stacey? That's exactly. a role for a journalist should be playing. That's that's the role for a journalist. And I would also say that I mean, experts are great, but you also the value a journalist should provide doesn't always is the ability to understand those experts and translate what they're saying to something normal people can understand. That's what you do in technology. Insultful. No, but that's what you right. do. It's, it's trying to come up with like, and then put that information into context. But to do that, you need to have a historical understanding of like in this issue, I may not be an epidemiologist, but if I learn enough about it and talk to enough smart people, I could, I could play one on TV. No, I well, would have the context. Problem. I have the context. No, because listen to me. Having done this with incredibly technical fields, so like software defined networking, semiconductor manufacturing, freaking wireless, I I cannot build you a network. I understand at a really fairly technically deep level how those things work and happen. And I built that up over 20 years of talking to people who are way smarter than me. And that's the context that I bring to talking to those experts. And it is inherently valuable because I can compare what two or three other people say about something to what I know. And that doesn't make me less important or valuable than that particular expert because I'm an amalgamation of a bunch of different thoughts and all this context that even they might not have because I'm old. I would right. use the word I, I synthesis, right? Go ahead, yeah. Jeff. I certainly agree with that. But my, my butt is this. We are also uh, bombarded with cyber boys becoming uh, armchair uh, epidemiologists with their hot takes. We are, and, 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 and then the next week, they're, they're experts in, in evacuating uh, war zones. And they're, the next week, they're the experts in something else. And, so, and, so the, and the hot takes spread not just from social media, but they spread into media itself, into proper media, where some journalists i think get too taken with themselves yeah that's a and problem in, the, in our field issue. in technology reporting as well there's a, a lot of people on youtube who are not expert uh who may even you know be on the take so to speak from companies that they cover because they don't have any journalistic code but there are also some very good people isn't that always the responsibility yeah. of the reader to try to ferret uh, out well, whose responsibility is that? I, I agree it is, but I think that's where we get that. No, we're, we're hearing people say, no, this goes back to your first story. Um, the platform should get rid of that bad stuff. But then. Well, that's just as line? bad as, as I mean, that's just somebody else. That's some other person telling you what to think. So, yes, in the end, it is the reader's responsibility. I agree. But I don't think right now the commentary about that agrees because media feels as if they're being displaced. Yeah. So I agree with everything state said. Absolutely. Yeah. But. Um, it's in a, it's in a, an ecosystem that includes uh, cyber boys and their hot takes. So we get back to that thing that I've always felt was a little pat, but everybody always says, "Well, you just have to teach people to uh, have uh, critical thinking and have." And, and I would argue pat. that you have to fund journalists so they can. I mean, one of the reasons why we don't have this is because there's not enough demand. Like, I have a deep knowledge of peering. It only comes up and is relevant, you know, maybe three times a year for a major everybody gives a hoot story, right? 
And the rest of the time, I've got to work on other stuff, but I still have to keep sort of up to date on peering if I ever want to use that when it next comes up. And those are the sorts of things we don't fund. I mean, I'm an, I'm a hugely expensive writer to have on your publication. Um, and <laughs> it's true. And the stuff that I know about and can add value on is it, it's not it's not large, right? For the mainstream reader, they don't care. They care right now because the chip shortage. So I would be really valuable for like the next few months and then poof, I'm gone again. So this is... Well, that's okay though. Don't you think that's kind of okay? Um, that people have a... Uh, <laughs> that you're that only as good as your last article that you're, that, you know, continually... No, I'm just continually... saying they, they can't afford to pay for the context that older beat journalists provide. Like you can't afford to become an expert well, there right is now definitely at a an newspaper. Issue with that. Yeah. Right. And so you're not a beat person and yeah. you end up doing every story you can possibly get assigned. And then you're as, as thin as, as a, as a dollar bill on everything you cover. Yeah. And that's where it is now. You're expected to do eight blog posts a day, as we used to put it. And yeah, it's not easy. Let's take a little break. This is a good conversation. You guys are, uh, I, you know, this is always a good. Maybe we'll talk about Google later. A good beat. Oh, we have lots of, <laughs> there is lots to talk about. Our show today brought to you by CrowdStrike. This is, the, I think, a very innovative, very smart, and very effective way to fight ransomware. We've all seen the headlines. We all talk about it on all of our shows. Ransomware attack of, after ransomware attack holding businesses hostage. I saw a statistic. There's a ransomware attack every 11 seconds. Every 11 seconds. It's, I don't, wouldn't blame you uh, if you feel like it's just a matter of time before they come for you. And you're going to have to decide... Do you pay or do you lose everything? There is a third option. Defeat adversaries before the fight even starts. With CrowdStrike, you're not alone in the battle against ransomware. A secure future demands a shared defense. Get the, get the idea? CrowdStrike. That's why CrowdStrike's Falcon platform uses something they call their threat graph. It uses advanced AI to analyze behavior on your device's servers and cloud workloads to find the threats and stop them. But it harnesses the power of every click, every action, and even every ally to grow stronger and stop the cyber threats before they can harm you. Their, their security platform delivers the industry's most powerful set of tools to fight today's most sophisticated cyber attacks, all delivered via the cloud through a lightweight, intelligent agent. Forrester did a study on uh, Falcon Complete, CloudStrike's Falcon platform, they found out it was delivering 403% ROI and, of course, 100% confidence. Falcon Complete stops breaches every hour of the day through expert management, threat hunting, monitoring, and remediation. It's backed by CrowdStrike's breach prevention warranty. They, they, they put their money where their mouth is. They guarantee for Falcon Complete managed customers who receive a warranty covering up to $1 million in the event of a breach. Terms and conditions apply. Gartner Magic Quadrant named CrowdStrike a leader for endpoint protection platforms in 2021. I think you'll be very impressed. Join the fight. Experience the power of the Falcon platform. Do it for free today. CrowdStrike.com slash twit. CrowdStrike. Because what we've built together is worth defending together. Please use that URL so they know you saw it here. CrowdStrike.com slash twit. Well... Big turnaround for OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> we are sex positive now. This is just the weirdest story. You may remember OnlyFans, which really I think started uh, as a platform for sex workers to sell direct to their customers. Uh, not sexual acts, but videos, pictures, that kind of thing. Um then, because of pressure, it turns out from the credit card companies and rules changes that were imminent, announced last week, no more porn. You can put nude, tasteful nudes up, but no more explicit content. Um, I mean, there was a hue and a cry, I think somewhat legitimately. I'm, I'm not, I don't have an OnlyFans subscription, but I think somewhat legitimately from sex workers, I don't think sex work should be illegal. I think in many places it's not. From sex workers who said, look, this was a safe way for us to make a living. 
and all of a sudden we're cut off. And be in control of our fate and not and not in the, in the hands of certain bad actors, uh, pimps yeah. and such. Yeah. Uh, same, same with the campaign that went after Craigslist and went after other platforms. Mm -hmm. It shoved it back underground. Yeah, I you know adult content's not going away, and it's not illegal by the way in in most jurisdictions, um, but there's still a very big stigma against it, and so Melissa Jurek is one of the best writers on this. She, she's on a book leave now, but she's she's really taught me about this. Uh, that air is an important uh, provider of rights. Yeah. And uh, so I saw the, the I have to, can I say this 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 tweet safely on our air? Hmm. Say it, and we'll, it. we'll bleep it if it's problem. No, no, no. It's just um, when, when they when they took it down, somebody said that they that they thought that uh, the founder of of, uh, of uh, OnlyFans must have um, uh, taken it down in a moment of guilt after a moment of rapture, shall we say? <laughs> Inevitable guilt that one feels. Yeah, but that and that's the puritanical point of right. view, isn't it? That. Yeah. Oh my goodness! I'm enjoying this. This must stop. <laughs> um, the credit card companies, I and I think I understand this, don't want to be liable. Uh, they did this already to Pornhub, because Pornhub was uh, accused of in a very famous, think talk about opinion pieces, very famous opinion piece by Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times, uh, pretty much ended Pornhub because he said there's revenge porn on there, there's non-consensual stuff on there. Uh, credit card companies immediately cut them off, and that was that. Uh, and then it's now kind of, I guess, what they're going to do. Um, somehow, I'm not sure how, uh, OnlyFans has figured out how to get around that. I don't know. The, uh, you know, I, I think the credit card companies aren't changing their tunes, so... I don't know what they're going to do. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. It might why, be Bitcoin. Why are the credit card companies, I mean, people use credit cards to buy porn all the time. Yeah, but when, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I, we I, wouldn't know anything about that, Stacey. I, but, know, but I don't know. Are. I don't know. That's a, that's a, a legitimate question. I is, is Are credit card companies going to decide, uh, you know, they're going to be the, every, the new blue laws? It's pressure Right. I, I, you know, last week, I think we we're talking about the Postal Service and, and how the Comstock, that was the pressure point at which you could bring by the Puritans against sex and the things that were seen as bad. And and the, the credit card companies are just a, a, a pressure point. So the parents, television council, people like that can go after them and they make them nervous about their business. So it's a much who's going to stand up in favor of porn at a major banking company. They're going to say, OK, 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 we'll we'll. But there are, know. I have oh, to say, plenty Scooter of sites X. out there. Scooter X has an explanation. So he does. He says banks now have to ensure that sellers have documented consent as well ah. as age and identity verification. <laughs> So, identity verification. So I think that's a requirement for that, pornography. That pressure came in part from this. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yes. Uh, legitimately. Right. You don't want underage <laughs> performers. Maybe that's a problem on, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe OnlyFans has decided well, they don't, we, we can do this. They can, have policies yeah. in place to document people, but they're probably not as rigorous. I don't know. Oh, I mean, I just saw a study that said <laughs> that uh, you, that thirteen-year-olds and under know easily how to get around pretty much every every restriction on all the platforms. Well, and the UK has been is going to is going to require um, identification for the purposes of age, which which has a horrible chilling effect. Yeah, and guess where? Now I think they overturned this, but initially the the way you would get this verification is by going to your local pub and <laughs> showing up with ID. <laughs> and they would stamp your card uh, they because they needed local places people could go to verify their ID. I don't know. I think that did not make it into the final version of the law. Well, I'll see here. Each verification law explained. Um, in 2019, they would introduce a new law. So I wonder what happened to the BBC. I think it did not. It okay, drops plan for online pornography age verification system. You're right. That was October 2019. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I mean, I, I don't really have an opinion one way or the other. As I said, I don't have any OnlyFans accounts. I think s platforms like Patreon, which I think Patreon also might have some adult content on it. Oh, yeah. P platforms oh, yeah. like Patreon are fantastic. It's what we use for our club. Twitter. we use their memberful service. 
I think they're fantastic for, for people who create content to go directly to their audience. There's no reason why people who create adult content should somehow be eliminated from that group of people arbitrarily. I agree there should be ways to verify consent and verify age. That's obviously something that has to happen. Maybe uh, only... I think Tumblr got, got you know, kicked in the groin, so to speak. Uh, when, because of its corporate owners, it took down just simply nudity. And Tumblr had a lot of artistic expression that used that. And then suddenly there was a fear about it. Was, there, was a, there was a chill on the naked skin there. It's too bad. I mean, I think it'd be nice if society just kind of accepted that uh, sexuality and nudity is part of life and not something to be uh, true, especially France. since we, we celebrate violence in all its forms and yeah. fashion. Well, I think the, I mean, if the issue is stopping kids from That's posting, fine. I agree. That yeah, should not be, uh, that sh they've got to prevent that if that's an issue. But I don't think, I don't, maybe it's a big issue. I don't know. I think most of the people on OnlyFans are adults who have decided. Probably most, but if there are some kids yeah, yeah. getting on there and doing that, that is. It's my hope that that's exactly what OnlyFans did is, is come up with a system to prevent that. Is there other, um, there is stuff besides porn on OnlyFans. I've never really, I've never gone on OnlyFans. No, in fact, know, earlier this year, trying OnlyFans. trying to not fans, be known for porn. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they kind of started to really, and, and there are some big celebrities on OnlyFan, OnlyFans. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what they offer, probably, you know, other stuff. But, um, yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> the biggest turnaround in history. Uh, hey, we were talking before okay. we before we end the journalism topic. We should probably mention the passing of uh, the guy who put the New York Times on the internet, uh, the Richard. Editor. Yeah, Richard Meislin. He was a Times editor. Uh, has passed away at the age of sixty-eight, which is I can tell you right now far too young. Amen. Uh, <laughs> uh, he was, it says, according to the Times, instrumental in the newspaper's embrace of digital technology. The Times uh, is a. a among a handful of newspapers who've really made this transition to digital successfully. Um, did you know Rich him, was Jeff? the editorial? Yeah, I knew him some. I knew Martin Nissenholz, who was the business side equivalent, better. But but Martin and Rich and some others at the Times, Vivian Schiller, were among the early leaders. Uh, and the Times, of course, remember, was Times on AOL. Uh, they created a local times thing. Uh, they experimented a lot. They were early in on RSS, thanks to Dave Weiner. They experimented with with uh, advertising models. The Times was the was the leader for so long. Um, Here's one thing I appreciate: the New York Times cooking app introduced in 2014, which I have subscribed to ever since, drew on Mr. Meislin's vision 20 years earlier of digitally organizing and sharing our wealth of recipes. Uh, Ooh, I subscribe to that too. It's a great app. In fact, that's probably well, where I you mean, got I'm your. Not, your I'm not, we were a little far ahead of them when it came to to Connie and Ashton Epicurious. I just want to say with okay, them. fine. But uh, where did Stacy get her corn pasta recipe? New York Times recipes. <laughs> Last year, corn cooking, cooking. <laughs> I, I, by the way, I subscribed to Epicurious as well, or I did. I don't think I still do, but for a long time, it was the most beautiful of all the recipe apps. It was just gorgeous, as good as, the, as beautiful as the magazine. Last year, New York Times Cooking attracted 113 million users. Pretty good success. So uh, anyway, thought we'd, we'd pass that R. I. P. along. R.I.P. Rich. R.I.P. Uh, yeah, we're getting to the point point in time in the internet revolution where some of many of the pioneers are, are getting a little long in the tooth. Mm -hmm. And we're all we're all starting to uh, make our way towards the uh, western havens. Uh, so my sister my sister was asking today because uh, I'm down here in, in a town, Sun City Center, Florida, where you by law you have to be 55 to live in the town, not just the building, the town. Um, and and my father has a World War II veteran hat, and she and I talked today to a, a guy named Bob who's 99 years old who flew. Uh, Air Force jets over China. I mean, it's amazing. So what they talk about here, especially in the complex where my, my folks have been, um, is uh, World War II and the Korean War and being veterans. And my generation, certainly Stacy's generation, is not going to have that commonality. You know, what are we going to talk about, Leo? The Grateful Dead when we're in the, in the old folks' home? Yeah. I'll I mean, be talking about Google. I'll just tell you, Jeff. Actually, I... 
Lisa and I went to see Billy Idol on Saturday. <laughs> and That's it's true. really when you, are... when you go to see a concert like that, uh, you you see immediately that the people who are Billy Idol fans are now in their 50s and 60s. And it's really interesting. I mean, it was a elder <laughs> audience. <laughs> Some kids, parents bringing their kids and stuff. But for the most part, people my age and older, because uh, Billy Idol was huge in what, the early 80s. He was an MTV star. And there was even a guy probably in his 60s who was complete head to toe dressed like Billy Idol in leathers with studs and chains. <laughs> and I noticed uh, his uh, his uh, Lexus uh, car key hanging from his belt as well. It was, a, it was a very interesting scene, I have to tell you. I wish I got a picture of that because it was kind of hysterical. I want to envision now uh, Leo in the old folks' home. Um, <laughs> Do you I used to be on radio. I wish I remember radio. I often, uh, I often. What's radio? I often thought I'd be in the Skid Row. Let with me a sign tell you. Saying we'll announce for food. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did not stay for the white wedding encore. I did not. How did you know that, Scooter X? <laughs> Scooter oh. X knows everything. <laughs> we we left right before uh, Rebel Yell. Um, but it was fun. Uh, yeah, well, and that's the other thing I noted. The, the the entire band, which also was getting on in years, instead of the traditional Jack Daniels bottle, they were all drinking Gatorade. So <laughs> you, you gotta you got to keep your energy up for, <laughs> for jumping around on stage. Hey, speaking of the New York Times and the New York Times recipes, uh, this makes me sad. The New York Times crossword puzzles for the longest time supported a Format dot p u z scooter x is reminding me the Times has decided to no longer support this open standard the p u z format. They're going to basically say no one else can publish New York Times articles. I you you still had to subscribe to get access to the content, but I use a very nice Macintosh third party program which will no longer work starting August tenth. Oh no! I'm just getting into crossword puzzles. Oh, I love crossword puzzles. Ooh. The good news August, is the August Times was two weeks has ago. yeah right. The Times has an excellent uh, crossword app itself, but there were even better third party apps. Plus, is there a dot sod standard? I'm sure there is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, Sudoku is a much easier thing to you know. I mean, all it is is a nine by nine grid. And you say where the numbers are. I think it'd probably be fairly simple to do. Uh, crossword puzzles a little more complicated because you got to include the clues and so forth. So the uh, the across light dot p u z format. Sorry to say, is uh, no longer. I mean, it's going to continue, but the New York Times is no longer going to support it. Uh, well, be that way. Be that way. Yeah. See, I, mm, not sure. I I think that's a good thing. You know, another thing that we'll be talking about in the old folks' home, Jeff, remember when credit cards used to have a magnetic stripe across the back that you would swipe? I remember my char my mother's charge plates. <laughs> charge plates. Remember that? They'd run this big metal. thing across a carbon. Yeah. Jun, jun. Yeah. Um, magnetic stripes are on their way out. MasterCard will be the first payments network to phase it out. Of course, they've shifted over to uh, chip and pin or chip and sign um, microprocessors that are in. So much the, better. Yeah. So much better. You know, they're not 100% secure. They're a little easier, though. Uh, I mean, they're a little harder to uh, reproduce the the chip that's in the credit card. So that, I guess, gives you some more security. Um, based on the decline in payments powered by mag stripes after the chip Based payments took hold. Newly issued MasterCard credit and debit cards will not be required to have a stripe starting 2024 in most markets by 2033. So you got a little time. No MasterCard. What happens when the power goes down or the internet goes out? They just have to write your credit card number down for later. Oh, processing. I mean, that's that's happened to me. I that's mean, I just, I, I'm like, oh. Yeah. That's interesting. I don't know. Um, I don't yeah, think the, you're right. the mag stripes probably didn't work then. They, yeah, they just pull yeah. it. Like a couple of places have literally pulled out the little credit card plate things yeah. and just kept the sw yeah. slips. But yeah. okay. Uh, you must have put this in here, Jeff. Bear <laughs> makes off with Amazon package. 
Yes, I did. <laughs> How did yeah. I know? That's not a that's that's an actual bear. It looks like a brown bear. Uh, Bristol, Connecticut. It's a black bear. Is it a black bear? That's it. You know, thanks to uh, thanks to uh, these video doorbells. Now we're going to get more and more of more of these videos. <laughs> there was one thing that drove me nuts. One guy finds a new way to say "I love you" to his wife every day, going out the door, and I'm thinking, man, that's going to wear thin in 20 years. Oh God! She saved every. Video I guarantee you, she stopped watching those a long time ago. Yeah, I bet. I bet. <laughs> oh, honey, <laughs> did you see my latest? <laughs> yeah, that was good. How'd you like the thing I did with the balloon? Oh, yeah, that was great. Yeah, honey. Yeah. Honey. Oh, uh, that's good. What do you want for dinner? Um, did you take out the trash? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, did you see what I did when I took out the trash? Oh, yeah, that was cute. I did, I did. <laughs> Elon Musk's Tesla bot. It's, it's a dancer in a uh, suit that's apparently uh, going to do the Charleston. This thing. was insulting. This is an insult. This is this is an insult. <laughs> I am insulted. I'm just going to I was so frustrated by this. And then I was even more frustrated by people even talking about it. Like, we should not be talking about this. Do not give him You're any just, attention. No, we are letting him troll us all. There is no way robots are ready for this. That kind of well, generic. It's pretty yeah. clear okay. to me that this was an attempt to with a little bit of hand-waving and Charleston dancing, say, pay no attention to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration yes. investigating our self-driving vehicles. <laughs> pay no attention Instead to that. Instead of caring about your safety, we're yeah. going to just troll you with this dancing robot person in a robot suit. Yeah. However, I would, will would say, you? Halloween costume of the year. Go on. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, Stacey, uh, uh, so uh, my view is if robots are like mimes, I'm going dystopian and I want to destroy all robots. Oh, yeah, I hate that's mimes. good. Mimes but are bad, too. Clowns. Yeah. Clowns, mime mimes, world. and robots. That's Those are the big three now, aren't they? They're on. They're yeah. So, um, I'm, going, the, I'm uh, going moral panic. NHTSA or NUTSTA, as some that's a, as <laughs> some people call it, uh, will be probing the autopilot software. Uh, since 2018, it has logged 11 incidents, including 17 injuries and one fatality, in which the vehicle's autopilot features crashed into stationary emergency vehicles 11 times in the last three years. Most of these incidents took place after dark, with the software ignoring scene control measures, including warning lights, flares, cones, and an illuminated aero board. You know, this is a case where I'll, 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 I'll surprise you, perhaps. Um... I can't think of a better field that requires regulation than this and that hasn't been regulated. Completely agree with you. Agree with you. Although here's what it, what I don't understand is the first two times this happened, we're like, oh, man, these things are confused by, you know, our emergency setting. Put up a sign with a freaking QR code. I mean, we know how to make things legible to robots. <laughs> it is very simple to give someone some sort of waterproof, avoid this area. I mean, it really is. Sure. So just like it's just you're software. trained to put your code yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this, in fact, you, you don't even probably need a QR system. code. You probably could just say, look no, for I, flashing warning okay. lights. That might be a sign. Apparently, according well, no, to- No, I meant, I meant like some sort of, instead of just putting up, like they put the flares to talk to humans. You need to put up something to yeah, indicate yeah, yeah. to robots, robots that is stay away. by them. No Charlestoning here. Okay, that's all. <laughs> uh, I don't know what else to talk about. Let's talk about the new Fitbit. The Charge 5. Have Do you have one? No, no. It's just launched today. Oh, you wouldn't have one so soon. Do you like no it? One would. Let's, I, I do, but I'm frustrated because Google's pulling, let's call it a Google messaging situation here with their fitness stuff. Yeah. Because I'm like Fitbit. They've got their weird ties and stuff, which there's news out on that. And then they've got Wear OS. And they've got the Fitbit app and the Fit app, and I don't know where anything fits anymore. This and is just like messaging, messy. isn't it? They just can't. Yes. They just yeah. can't make up their mind. So, Samsung said we're going to stop doing Tizen. We're going to merge with Wear. We're going to make a Tizen slash Wear OS that will probably be mostly Wear OS because it's going to use the Wear OS store. I have ordered, and I will get Friday. I'll have it for next week. The Classic Four from Samsung, their new watch, along with the Flip Three, because I figured I should have the two together. Uh, I'll let you know. I've liked 
for a long time, I had a Gear 3 uh, Frontier. I liked it quite a bit. But that the Wear watches just were terrible. They, they, they had slow chips in them. They had bad battery life, bad software. Google had ignored them for years. So at least Samsung's putting re-energizing the Wear OS. They're going to use more modern chips. Uh, it should Who's be in charge of that OS now? Is it Samsung or Google? Who's going to be the primary developer? It's got to be Google. It's got to be Google, yeah. I this feel like Samsung has that's, capitulated, thrown in the towel. But Google screwed it up. I know. That's what I don't understand about I know. And then Google buys Fitbit and continues with the Fitbit line, which I'm sure Fitbit fans will be very happy about. Uh, right. the, and the Fitbit app and the Pebble, oh, I mean, the underlying OS on the Fitbit. I don't know if it's still they bought Pebble, the Pebble right? stuff. Yeah. I know that you can actually the Pebble stuff may be still a UI thing now still because you can still have your watch face look more like a Pebble. But yeah. You do have to, unfortunately, with Fitbit, you have, you know, there's you subscribe, right? Ten bucks a month, eighty dollars a year for the you don't premium. You have to subscribe. You don't have to, but do you? In do, fact, do you want to? Originally, no. Originally, uh, I'll check it out again. But at the beginning of the pandemic, they offered it for free, so I was oh. like, I will check it out. And it was so bad. I gave back my free version. I was <laughs> like, this is worthless. It's just cluttering up my screen and has no point. So they're going to offer. So like I get many options on my current charge three. I don't know if they're going to pull back features as they launch new watches to make the subscription more exciting. But right now I get everything I want without a subscription. I have I to say it's, it's pretty attractive. $180. Um, it's kind of all soft and rounded. Uh, it, you know, and it uh, it sounds like this is a, a fairly competent competitor to the Apple Watch, which is the king of the hill in this, uh, at least in the non-specialized fitness watches. I mean, I think they're... Yeah, and they're adding things that they stole, like the Whoop band and their, their heart rate variability score. They're calling it daily readiness experience. So they're, okay. they're pulling that from like the Garmin and the Whoop yeah, world. So yeah, that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, you do have to pay for that. Um uh, so ox they're, oxygen they also, saturation, they're going to do uh, SPO2. Um, and I'm interested because Amazon has this, and it was actually one of my favorite features of the Halo, which is you could access through the Halo subscription, which is only four bucks a month, uh, all kinds of like content from other places. And it looks like Google's actually doing that here with Bar 3, Daily Burn, Less Mills workouts. So... Because originally with the Google Plus, the Fit, sorry, originally with Fitbit Plus, you got really stupid Fitbit coached workouts and they were terrible. I mean, like the whole experience was confusing because you had to open up a separate app, but then you had to talk to your Fitbit. And so there's a couple of features mix, missing from the five that your charge has, like the uh, floors climbed altimeter. It won't have that. Oh, I love my I think that's climbed. a good thing to know. And it won't have the relaxed guided breathing. Do you do that? I, I never do that. No. I will say I actually, I bought one a couple Fitbits back that didn't have the floors climbed. And I missed it so much that Well, I don't get the five purchased. then. Well, I, now I won't. That's kind of a shame. I don't understand why they didn't include it. But maybe that was to make room for other features. They do a lot of other things. Um, yeah. And seven day I like battery it life. When I'm going on a hike. It's fun. Right. I don't think anything has battery life. Apple Watch, Samsung watches, uh, Wear OS, they, none of them have seven day battery life. That's one thing Fitbit really has down. Um, yeah, I just charge probably... mine every night. I don't. It's really? Just... I charge mine like every 10 days. I, I have my charger next to my bed, and every now and then I'll. You know, just stick it well, on my, the charger. Mine, and... being the Apple Watch, requires that oh. I charge it every night. Uh, if it, it charges up pretty fast, though. You could, uh, e I think, quite reasonably wear it all night. It would be still enough battery and then put it on the charger while you got ready for work. In a couple of hours, it would be fully charged again. So I think there's people who do that. I don't like to wear a watch to bed. It takes bed. you a couple hours to get out of the house? Um, John does. He wears it to bed. Well, no, so... Uh, what do you wake up and go out the door half an hour later? Don't you want to have you, breakfast? Yes. Yes. Where are you going, yes. Stacey? Why would you? Anytime I leave, <laughs> yep. my, I mean, so the I max get up, amount of time. I have a nice cup of okay. coffee. I read the yes. paper. I no. shower. I shave. Brush my teeth. Yes. Yes. Dad, we're up to twenty minutes so far. 
And it's church, I'm up by to, I, You know, I'm up to like 40 minutes by now, but okay. <laughs> um, sometimes I'll I do a little uh, Peloton. That's a 45-minute thing. Okay, yeah, if I'm doing I, a workout beforehand. <laughs> I, set up my, I set up my day to begin at 11 a.m. so that I can get up at 8 and still have plenty of time for work. And I'm often late, so there. <laughs> I just things, you know what? If you, it's it, work expands to fill the time available. If you have three hours to get ready and get out the door, you're going to take three and a half. It's just, uh, it's Leo's law. <laughs> okay. This is not a democracy. It's just Leo's law. It's Leo's law. Yep. Leo's law. Uh, a court. We talked about this extensively uh, on uh, Twit. A court has ruled. That Proposition 22, the gig worker initiative in California, was unconstitutional, and Lyft and Uber will have to have to hire their drivers. No more, no more faking. Now, of course, Lyft and Uber will will appeal, and this will go on for yeah, years. Yeah. But uh, the reason Prop 22 is unconstitutional, there's a little bit of it in there, which I'm sure the folks at Lyft and Uber were very serious about saying the legislature could not change this law and the judge said you know you can't limit the power of a future legislature to change the law that's unconstitutional so the entire ballot measure is unenforceable which is a bit of a blow for uber and lyft um it, it was also it, it, it sounded like it, it was indeed a constitutional uh, ride too far It'd be like Donald Trump saying everything I've done, I, I, I yeah. have done is it can't forever. be overturned. Can't. Yeah, can't overturn it. Yeah. No, I think it's. I think the judge is right. That was a little bit overreaching on the part of Uber and Lyft. He tried too hard. Yeah, I'm. I'm always torn about this because, uh, you know, in fact, I voted yes on Prop 22 because I was convinced by the ads that Uber and Lyft spent hundreds of millions of dollars to run, saying, you know, featuring Uber and Lyft. Uh, workers saying, look, I'm a mom. I got kids. This is the only way I can make a job. I set my own schedule and it works for me. And I always think, well, if people didn't like it, couldn't they just do something else? Uh, it must work for some people. Or is it the case that the job market is so inflexible that you just got to take a terrible job because there's nothing else you can do? If we've, re we've reinvented feudalism. Yeah, um, where you're so desperate and you have to. Is that the case? Anyway. You think? I mean, that's the same thing with Amazon I, warehouses. I, mean, I, I wonder. That's like, how I kind do of you feel. have to take we that have terrible no, job. Yeah, if you have no social safety net, right? Yeah. You have kids. You have rent due. You have to do whatever you can. And yeah. if there's enough of you out there, and there's a lot, I mean, your only option otherwise is just to starve and be homeless and plenty of people are taking that option yeah. they're not taking it willingly no kidding. yeah I mean, yeah yes uh, i know i'm a socialist we move on <laughs> well i you know i i just don't know i mean uh, um i i understand that um uh, and i guess i'd like to talk to people who say yeah i had to be an amazon warehouse worker because there was nothing else i could do or i had to take a you job you could talk to my brother Really? He has to be, I mean... He couldn't, in, in like, say, just go down the street and get a better job? Like, I don't know. He must has, be a, a, better job he has a GED and the ability to work as an auto mechanic. But he has ADHD that's not, uh, what's it called? Medicated. And so he'll, you know, he crashed some cars, so now he can't really work in right. many places that have that. And then he has an ethical then, issue with a lot of the garages. Shouldn't, so. shouldn't he be glad then that there is a job that will hire him? That yes, he's glad, but he's up. also like... And it pays he's, well. He's, it doesn't pay him well. And he's putting... He had to go buy a separate car to put the miles on. Like, he's, he's fronting this company that has raised well, hundreds like one, yeah. of millions or billions of dollars. I mean, so... It works for him. Is it an ideal job for him? It's probably the best job that he can get at this moment. And, you know, Amazon Warehouse, he could do that for a little while, but it's pretty grueling work yeah. and he doesn't have health insurance. Right. No, I understand. It's completely legitimate if you have a job to say, I want conditions to be better. Uh, you know, I want more pay. That's All of that's completely legitimate. But if, a, but if a job really like Uber and Lyft driving doesn't or DoorDash delivery does not make sense... For you economically, I guess they're. I guess they're just people who have to 
have to do something that they they lose money at. I don't I don't get it. Um, you know, I, I well, confess I'm, I I voted wrong on that, but I, I was persuaded by the ads that said, "Oh yeah, this is a, this is a job that works for me," and I wanted those people to be able to take that job. But well, we talked about this before. I've talked I've talked to drivers who 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 insist, insist that still. Um, yeah. Uh, but the, but work is going to change completely. Right. Not completely. Work right. is going to change profoundly, and I don't think we know where it comes out yet. Um, and COVID obviously had a huge structure there. And I, I saw somebody complaining. Well, Amazon was unfair to its competitors by paying a, a higher salary. Well, TS competitors. Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's a good thing. Yeah, and they changed the marketplace and they changed labor. Now they did. They have a lot of other things they do badly, um, and it's grueling, as as Stacy says, and and their health, their 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 safety uh, cares aren't what they should be. Uh, nonetheless, they raised. They've kind of single-handedly raised wages around the country. That's important. Yeah. And 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 with with you know one thing we have with, with my father is trying to get help from him here. You can't get anybody now, partly because that's these companies that do it don't pay well, and it's hard work. Um, so wages are going to have to go up, and then we're going to have fear about inflation. Right. But it's time. It's, it's to not just. Wages. So I was actually surprised because there were a bunch of articles about like the ferry system here is having a hard time hiring like other places and they pay really well. But then when you dig into it, you realize that to get this job, you have to have like two weeks of training on your own dime to work in the ferry system. And then dime. you have two wow. years. Yeah. Then you have two years where you're basically on call where the, the ferry they will call you wherever they need you. And that could be anywhere from like near Seattle all the way up to like Bellingham, which is like two hours away from Seattle. And you just have to show up. You don't have a set schedule or anything. You just are basically on call. So like you don't the have- Like apprentice structure, right? Exactly, you have, you which- have to, You have to pay your dues. When you understand that, you're like, oh, that would be really hard. Like if you have a family, for example. <laughs> I, I have to point out, though, that's how unions worked for years is you had to work your way up through the union and become a first an apprentice, then a journeyman. And, and there were that was the same kind of thing if you wanted a good union But then job. you had a job for the rest of it. Well, and you that's did true. That there was process a reward. When you were yeah. young. Yeah. Like, well, like that's a 40 Stacey, year old. I just listen. Sorry, Stacey. Oh. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I just listened to Box, the the, 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 the the book that Leo made fun of me for, for uh, buying last oh, week yeah. <laughs> by the author of... How is a, that? A, a, it's, well, I enjoyed it, but it's really wonky, so watch out. Yeah. But it's about the creation of this different economy around the container, and it's fascinating. But what I didn't know, Stacey, to your point was you thought that as a longshoreman, let's say, uh, yeah, you got set for life. No, you were, you were uh, your seniority meant you got hired before the next schmuck, but... It wasn't until containers came in that they actually got permanent jobs because it was the way the union fought uh, for protection from the technology. And so, well, if you give us real jobs and real guaranteed wages and, and benefits, okay, we'll let you do this because you protect our current members. Same in typesetters unions. Um, a lot of this with technology, they didn't become wage paying jobs until that was the price that they got for the disruption that they could see was imminent i was i didn't know that especially about longshoremen but once you got the job you could be a longshoreman philosopher and then the world is your oyster yes. yeah yeah, yeah. Yes. our show today brought to you by a brand new podcast from red hat and i'm really enjoying it called compiler they only have uh, two episodes out so far but i've really thought it was uh, uh really great compiler comes to you from uh, from red hat it's hosted by Angela Andrews and Brent Simino. They're great together. Uh, it's very nicely produced, and it it's it's fun because I I you know they say in the in the copy they say it's a podcast about technology and and how it's uh, changing our lives and big and small and strange tech topics. But really, what I gather from it, at least from the first two, is questions people are asking us around here at Red Hat and answers. Uh, for instance, I listened to the first episode was, should managers code? And it was fascinating. They talked to everybody from the CFO uh, at Red Hat who says, no, I manage. I only get to code 20% to another manager who said, I don't, I don't uh, code at all, but 
uh, when I'm on vacation, I do the advent of code and I solve those problems. It was really fascinating. You hear a lot of perspectives from the diverse communities behind the code, and it's really fun. Compiler brings together a curious team of red hatters, as they call them, to tackle big questions in tech, like uh, what is technical debt? That's coming. What are tech hiring managers actually looking for? And do you have to know how to code to get started in open source? Uh, it's really uh, fascinating. Uh, it's fun. It's a quick listen. They're not very long. They're about 25 minutes. I'm jealous. But <laughs> I think you're going to really uh, enjoy it. The, the first episode, as I mentioned, Should Managers Code, talks about, well, managers maybe should manage, but then some managers really love to wade into it. And, you know, uh, it started as an internal email discussion at Red Hat and uh, became a very interesting, uh, much more uh, uh in-depth topic than I thought it would. And what's great is it's very well edited, very well produced, so it's fun to listen to, and you really get the information in there in a very uh, quick and digestible manner. Red Hat has done another great podcast, Compiler, a Demystifying Tech, One Question at a Time. The first episode, just as I said, just almost just came out. August 5th came out, and now they have a second episode You'll find it everywhere, Apple's podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, of course, it's on the Red Hat site as well. It's really a great show. Well done, Angela and Brent. Uh, congratulations. Find it on your... Here's, a, here's the current one just came out. 20 minutes. It's quick. What can video games teach us about edge computing? I love that. I love that. Compiler. Learn more at red.ht slash twit. We'll also include a link on this episode's show page. Or subscribe in your favorite podcast client. They've done a nice job. red.ht. I like to highlight other podcasters doing great work. red.ht slash twit. Or just look for Compiler on your favorite podcast platform. It's really fun. Uh, let's do a, 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 a Google change log, shall we? Play that, uh, play that funny sound. The Google Change Log. Big news for San Francisco's. Starting August 24th, you can ride in a Waymo. Their first ride is they won't take you downtown. They won't go. They won't go anywhere. If you've ever driven in downtown San Francisco, you know why. You need to be a trusted tester. So I don't, I don't know how you get to be a trusted tester. But for the first time, San Franciscans will be able to hail an autonomous ride in one of their all-electric Jaguar I-PACE vehicles equipped with the fifth-generation Waymo driver. They've been doing it in Phoenix for years. In fact, I've been watching videos and of people... Pardon me? Where is downtown San Francisco? So down by the financial district where the high-rises are. At least I looked at a map. I may be wrong. I should... But I looked at a map of what they were serving. Actually, it was an interesting map because it compared that to where most Uber and Lyft rides are. <laughs> and it's and it, neither the, never the twain shall meet. Almost everybody huh. going in Uber and Lyft is going down to the, you know, Pier 39, the wharf, the financial district, the Embarcadero, and the, the Waymo. The, by the way, I don't even like driving down there. And I've driven down yeah, there for no, years. Yeah, no, I, I was crazy. just like, huh, I wonder, I wonder where, like, I'm yeah. thinking about, like, oh, Soma or... Market, Soma's on, you know, or, south of market's fine. Um, I don't know. You'll have to, I, you'd, I guess you'd have to look at a map. I'll look at the map. Yeah. Um, but if you want to go to uh, Golden Gate Park, no problem. They could take you there. I think that's really more of a, a safety issue. I don't think you want to drive down there with all the, the buses and the bums. The it's buses, not, the bums, the construction. Yeah, the, it's not easy. Although not I haven't easy. been down there in two years. Yeah. Presumably it's different. <laughs> Uh, well, there's more of all of the above, <laughs> I guess is the answer. Do you ever, is this the ultimate answer to Prop 22? Yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Do you ever get to, to San Francisco anymore, Jeff? I haven't. Well, um, Not since Google yeah, I.O., right? Yeah. 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 But it's, 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 yeah. I, 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 flying right now, I consider no fun at all. I, I used to, I flew 300,000 miles a year before pandemic that went to zero of course i don't think i'm gonna fly much yeah you wear a mask the whole time uh oh that's yeah. no fun. especially when coming to this place yeah that's no fun um do they do they require a test or anything no because you're flying to no. no 
to go to Hawaii, it's we had Florida. to have, Yeah, but when going to Hawaii, we had <laughs> yeah. to either have a test or a vaccination, uh, proof of vaccination. So, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. I'm still having fits that my university is not mandating vaccination for staff and faculty and other universities like Lehigh and Columbia and places that care about their entire community. They should mandate yeah. that. I understand there should be exemptions for people who can't, for medical reasons, get a vaccination. Always, always the case, but yeah. geez, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Google is shutting down the Android Auto phone app. Good. It's a pain in the butt. Yeah. I love the Android Auto experience in my car, on the yes. screen of the car, but I, using it on your phone, is too, I think it's dangerous. Uh, there is an assistant driving mode uh, in the Google Assistant, and so that is to replace it. But uh, And that's, a little, I think, a little bit more uh, judiciously designed. I didn't ever like that Android Auto app. I'm with you. Google Meet will now warn you when you're echoing. <laughs> I love it. That's a good feature. It's called uh, the Slammer the, 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 the Slammer B feature. Yes. Jammer B? Jammer B? Yeah. 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 Uh, you're, you're not going. Here's the uh here's the, here's the, the right. warning you'll get. It'll say the sound from your speakers is picked up by your microphone and causing echo for other participants. So here's the recommendations. Use headphones. That's my recommendation. Lower your speaker volume or mute yourself when not speaking. Um, so good. Thank you, Google, for adding that. No more echoes in your Google Meets. We use Google Meet a lot. We use it for all our staff meetings, our editorial meetings, all that stuff. Really? You're not using Zoom for that? No. We huh. use we, Kevin and I use Google Meet to meet for the show and all of our stuff, too. Yeah, I don't know. I think we're... You know, we're, we pay for Google Workplace, Workspace, whatever yeah. they call it. So we figure it's part of the deal. You got to use Google stuff. We use, I mean, we have Slack. We could do it with Slack. We pay for Slack. Um, but I have a Jitsi server I set up, which no one uses. I'm intrigued by, like, what the rationalization of workplace tools would look like. You know, if you have Slack and Teams and a, Go I mean, a Zoom account, right? And these are not uncommon. Like, how... Sure. How is that going to happen? Too many choices. Post-pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. It's gotten, it's a little complicated because when you're dealing with, uh, you know, on a sales call or at outside agencies or other people, there's a little bit of a tug of war between who use, who sets up the meeting and who, which setup you're going to use. So we have to support everything because sometimes they want Zoom. Sometimes they want crazy stuff, you know? Like blue jeans? Like blue jeans, baby. I've done blue jeans calls, yeah. Well, I uh, liked Blue Jeans. No, I think Blue Jeans is actually pretty good. I like Ooh, Jitsi. Jeans is terrible. Okay. It sucks. It's so bad. I just didn't want to say it out loud. Um, <laughs> no, I don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a strong opinion. Uh, let me see. Well, a system update is available. Android 12 Beta 4.1 rolling out. This one's little. 6.48 megabytes. Uh, we're getting closer and closer to the release of Android 12, probably, I'm guessing, in October with the release of the Pixel 6. But uh, if you're on the beta track, beta 4.1 includes Pixel bug fixes, including for VPN and notifications. Google Chrome will let you save tab groups. That's a nice feature. I don't use Chrome. I'm using Firefox. But everybody, you, I know, Jeff, you do, and you love your tabs. Of course I do. Now you can save tab groups in one quick option. A save group toggle will be added to each group's drop-down menu. So you can save the group. So after a reboot, it returns. Ooh. That's nice because you got to update Chrome like every like five minutes. That's nowadays. a good point. Yes. So that you need that. Yeah. And... Even lab in uh, at Harvard. Yeah. Uh, last I checked, he he brags he had 530 open tests. Shh. Nothing to brag about. I'm. What is I'm... his computer doing? Is is it like heating his office? <laughs> I know it must be. <laughs> Poor thing. There needs, needs to be the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Computers. Yeah. I'm big on tab hygiene. I close them when I'm done. Sometimes. Too aggressively, like I go, oh shoot. Well, it's like my office after COVID. I mean, everything in there, I now I know I don't need. So if a tab stays open for for so long and I didn't yeah. use it, then I really you never did need it. No. Yeah, oh, that's right. I'm I'm the same way. And if you are, although I love 
the idea of tab groups and every browser will let, let you create a folder of bookmarks that you can open all at once. So I, I do sometimes do that. But honestly, I, I just like one tab at a time, guy. If you were excited about the Pixel 6, good news. The Pixel 5 and 4a 5G are now officially discontinued, which usually is a, a step prior to the release of a new phone. The, so they've got the 5a, and I guess the 6 any day now. Any day. Come on, sixes. Come on, yeah. sixes. Yeah, I'm ready for it. It sounds like we're all three getting one. Man, I am running out of memory on this phone, yeah. and some yeah, of my here. apps, Same I am just like, yeah. the heck? Yeah. yeah. You know what? Every I swear this is this is neurotic of me, but every single day I refresh the Asus CX9 page to see if it's not temporarily sold out anymore. I can, I can oh, give the money in order every I, day. I do that with the every Xbox day. Series X every day. See if I can buy an Xbox. I got to save my money because I've got a new phone coming up in October and I really want to get the new MacBook with the yeah, yeah. The, the new MacBook Pros. I'm really excited. Yeah, I'm, or please, maybe please, one of those please, new please, Mac minis they're rumoring, they're rumoring about. You know, you should listen to our show, Mac Break Weekly. We cover all the ins and outs of Macintosh <laughs> as well as iOS yes, I'll do. and all of that stuff. Partner program on YouTube now has 2 million members. Two million members. Yeah, launched uh, 14 years ago. This is their program to pay creators. Uh, of the two million members, a few dozen are really making some money. <laughs> to qualify, uh, you need yeah. a, a thousand subscribers, 4,000 hours of overall watch time in the past 12 months. You can earn money through ads, subscription fees, donations, live streaming, and YouTube premium revenue. Are yeah. we, are, what? The universe is out of order. Oh, no. What's the matter? You forgot something. Oh, and that's... <laughs> Google change <laughs> lock. Oh. oh, that was scary. Gosh, that was close. What if I'd ended the show without that? People would have just... It would have just been would open be forever. Night. Yeah, that's like distressing. But, you know, didn't we talk about that being the secret to, to Baby Shark? Is it never ends? Don't don't ever say those words. <laughs> <laughs> did, did hey, we... can we talk about Google's? Nope. 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 Squalo Bimbo? No? Okay. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> Google's uh, geofencing warrants. Oh, data. my God. <gasps> exactly what I talk about all the time on the show mm. and having access to this data. And it's so illegal. And we need to figure out how to make this, like, how to get away from this and thank you for letting people know how prevalent of an issue it really is yeah. Google. So Google does a tran regular transparency uh, report. This time I think for the first time they it's the uh, first time they published their oh sorry. Yeah. Well, go ahead. No. It's It's the first time they published their uh data about geofence warrants. Um the figures reveal that Google has received thousands of geofence warrants every quarter since 2018. In fact, it's one quarter of all U.S. warrants that Google receives. What is a geofence warrant, Stacey? It is when they ask, basically, for people of interest in an area where, like, where, send us the people who were in this area a crime, that a crime occurred based on their cell phone location data so if there was a robbery of a uh as there was just the uh, other day of a local beauty store in petaluma the petaluma police might go to google say tell us everybody who was in five within 500 feet of that store at the time of the robbery and that would net in everybody innocent and guilty alike and maybe not even the guilty yeah and when you're a victim of such a or when you're when your data has been compelled, Google will let you know that the police in this area have sought data on your phone. Oh, here's my, my daughter's home. But they don't tell you why or what. They just give you the police information, police department's contact. Hmm. And then you're like, uh, what is happening? Am I in trouble? What? Oh, no. You it's can see terrible. on the, uh, the graph on the transparency report. Uh, this just shows you the growth in this. The graph starts at zero in this first quarter of 2018, ends, of course, in the fourth quarter of 2020, and it's just stunning growth. 
Um, just uh, and and by the way, mostly local. The red is state jurisdictions. The blue is federal jurisdictions. So the the states have really number one state for geofence warrants: California, followed by Texas, Florida, Michigan, Georgia, Virginia, Illinois. Um, yikes, 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 yikes. So I'm glad. Thank you, Google, for being transparent about that. Uh, one quarter of all the U.S. warrants they receive, thousands a quarter. And so now we need Apple to publish this? <laughs> yeah. But I don't think Apple has the same kind of... Uh, in fact, I don't think Apple could respond to a warrant like that. Google has MAP. Well, I guess the Apple phone could. companies all do. Phone companies right? do. Do, yeah. do phone companies yes, have transparency do. reports? No. They do. do they? Do they? I don't know. I bet they don't. <laughs> Why would they? Yeah. Here is a, Dan, a little work from Danny Sullivan. You remember he left Search Engine Land to a, friend, go to work for a Google. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Verizon. Hey. Let's stay on this. Oh, Verizon Verizon has a AT&T report. and Verizon both published transparency oh, you reports. Sorry. Okay. You're so good. You're so fast. All right. Well, anyway, there. that's my Subpoenas story. in 2020, second half, Verizon, 59,264. Pen register trap and trace orders, 4,500. Wiretap orders, 627. Warrants, 15,000. Emergency requests from law enforcement, 37,000. Total, 121,000 back then. Down a bit from prior years. Okay, never mind. Thank you. Danny, on to Danny. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's right. I, I, actually, Danny's story is boring. Um, but Danny's sorry, our Danny. friend. Yeah, I know. He's he's but, updated yeah, how But he's not an works. exciting friend. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're done. We're done. You got I places think, to be, Jeff. I think you're exactly right. <laughs> Stacy Higginbotham is calling the shots. Oh today. no, I didn't. I did. Calling I didn't mean the shots with today. The show. <laughs> Get ready. Your I picks of the Danny. week coming up. I don't care. <laughs> it's over. It's over. I'm done. I'm out of here. Get ready. Your picks it's, of the week coming it's up. It's like next. an hour early. Oh jeez. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm not even hungry yet. <laughs> Let's start with your thing of the week. All right, I have two things for y'all. Yes. This is the new Nest Cam. Ooh. It just, the reviews went up on Ooh. Tuesday. Looks like the old um, Nest Cam. It does. This is, um, I'm trying to give y'all, here's a can of LaCroix for context. <laughs> uh, they, oh, they, they actually, this is heavier than the LaCroix. Okay. How does it compare uh, to a waffle, Casey? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. So, a couple it's... things to note. <laughs> and I also have the doorbell, but I didn't bring the doorbell in because I'm going to show you the pictures that the doorbell oh. is showing me. So you can get some some image quality action happening. So what's, both what's of these improved devices on this? Are, higher resolution, something like that, or um, well, this is their first refresh. So these oh batteries, that's the big deal. Sorry, oh, that's the new news. You don't have to plug yeah. it in anymore. These are all battery powered. You can plug them in, and they will have wires, but you don't have to. They are one seventy nine ninety nine. Google also added this. You see how this has a green light right now? Yeah. Um, it flashes when I'm actually, so it's the green light says it's processing something uh -huh. and then it'll flash when you're looking uh, to let you know that I'm looking at it directly. So I'm, I'm about to go look at it directly and we'll yeah. see it flash. I always uh, take Bye. that over. So the bad guys don't know I'm watching them. Oh, that's rude. <laughs> so what here, do you mean? Here I am watching. They're on my property. <laughs> the hell with them. I have, I have a lot of these cameras. I actually like them quite a bit. Yeah, they're really great. Um, so here, now you can see the inception that is oh, neat. my office. That's nice. Or, That's actually ah! looks pretty um, good. That looks like good quality. It's, it's really nice. Yeah. Um, it's a little, there. the motion sensor's in the bottom. So if you have your, this, there is a definite up and down in this camera. Down here, you can see where you plug it in. Although um, if you want there is a in. setting that you can say, I, I mounted it upside down. So that there is a the setting, image, which is you, good. Yeah. You beat me to it. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that is notable here is that it has more on-device AI. So locally, it can recognize nine object classes, including people, pets, packages, cats, dogs, 
other stuff. I don't remember the others. It would be great uh, if it could say, hey, I spotted a waffle at 12 o'clock. That would be so cool. Can't recognize waffles. <laughs> Why not? I'm trying to get a sense of how big that lens space is, Stacey. Is it bigger than a waffle or smaller than a waffle? Would you say? <laughs> it's, it's smaller than a waffle. It depends it, on the is waffle. Is it the same waffle. size as the old Nest Cam? Because it looks bigger, but I think that's just an artifact. Of it, it. No, no, it really, it, I think it's bigger than the oh, original okay. Nest Cam. Okay. This is their, so this is an indoor-outdoor cam. Okay. So, and you know, here's the kachunk. I know, I love that battery. magnet. Is it stolen? That, that's how awesome. does it not get stolen? Well, well, you got a video so, of somebody stealing it, basically. Yeah, you. I mean, people could steal it if they wanted to. They just steal this part, but then they wouldn't have yeah. you know, all kinds of other things yeah. they need, and you'd have video of it. Yeah, they'd be in your yard doing it. Well, plus, so. you could also just knock it down from the side, and you, it just. You know, I thought about oh, no, that. No, no, Jeff. If somebody were going to invade my home, they could go around and unplug it. Although now with the battery, that wouldn't work so well. Or they could, you know, yeah. knock it down. I put them pretty high, so they're not. You know, easily reached. Yeah, Have you, you don't want to put too high with the battery ones because then you got to recharge. Them. Yeah, no, no, that's why. Yeah, but I, mine, mine are the old ones that you plug in. Yeah, it just struck me as an insane design that it's not attached. It's a magnet. No, that's mine. Mine, mine have magnets too. It, it makes it much easier for you to position, it. attach it yeah. to things in yeah. position. Yeah. So you just have to. Yeah. Like, and there's a mounting plate, but I don't have that on there right now. I used to be. This was. Yeah. I used to be one of those guys. That, oh. Cameras just make you paranoid. Um, and then I just got some for review, and now I have them everywhere. I really like being able to look and see, you know, what's going on. Mostly it's to see what the cats are up to, stuff like that. I want to see the the um, the bird that knocks on the wood of my, of my house. So <laughs> oh, this would be good for that. Just stick it up high. Yes. Um, and you can always put them inside. Um, I found the app experience a little slow. I found the... The actual design of the app a little weird like you know you've got your history you've got your live view you've got the current view and then you have to like it's not exactly as intuitive as i'd like it to be i thought actually seeing the camera to my google displays was actually super fast it was like two to three seconds and yeah how quickly if you get a notification i mean do does the notification come right away if somebody comes up to the camera or whatever? Is it pretty quick? Like if you turned on the, if you got a notification and immediately went to the camera, would you see that act in process? So here, here we'll set because it's not on right now. I'll do okay. I'm I'm motioning in the camera now. It just turned on. Yeah. And it's confused now. I've stopped. And I'm not getting a notification. Oh, it's because it's not a person. Hold on. Sorry. I have a different setting. Up. You're not a okay. person? All this well, time? it only saw my hand. It doesn't oh, know that I'm okay. a person. Boy. <laughs> She's a mom. I'm the Tesla bot. Okay, here we go. I'm going to tell it it's a person. We. Let's see if that worked. The last When I was testing it, like, in life, I was actually walking in front of it as opposed to just doing this thing. So... This is not the most accurate test. Okay, it's not giving me anything. It doesn't recognize me as a person at this moment. Well, but it was... Can you see yourself in a mirror, Stacy? We've wondered. I'm, Sorry. I'm just Sorry. looking... And I can eat garlic. I'm um, looking yeah, at, our, at my front yard. I just saw somebody walking in my front yard and just checking to see, get sound. You can talk to them. It's nice. I like it. I'm a fan. You can have zones, so you don't get notifications. Like, for this is a good example. This is the street that goes by the house. I don't want notifications as people drive by. But if somebody's in my drive, I want a notification. And, in fact, I even have different notifications through different parts of the driveway. I like it. Now, this is the old one. Uh, I presume the new one's even better. Uh, I don't know if you should do I mean, like, I get frustrated by the, the subscription fees and all of that. Yeah, too, so. they've fixed that a little bit because you get one now, one fee, and I have many cameras and you just get one giant fee. This is where the cats usually walk oh, around. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's oh, the backyard. Oh, that's so pretty. Yeah. You have a nice backyard, my friend. Very... Yeah. Well, you can't do anything on that hill. It's too steep, but uh, you can look at it. And then, uh, actually, this camera we, was the first one we got because that right there is our neighbor who used to come down here and kill these trees. So I want to make sure I had a video <laughs> record <laughs> of the guy. Why coming. did he kill those trees? Uh, he, I think that he thought they were blocking his view or something. I don't know. But oh. we didn't know it was him, uh, so I wanted a camera. But somebody stripped the bark off in a strategic fashion on some of these trees up here. 
And we figured, well, who else, right? Did you stop him? Uh, yeah, we uh, yeah we stopped him. <laughs> Let's say Mr. Smith and Mr. Wesson stopped him. Shall we put it that way? We live in the uh, in wild west. Wild west. <laughs> you threatened your neighbor with a gun? Uh, I didn't actually threaten him with a gun. Lisa said, I have a gun. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm not afraid to use it. <laughs> Okay. You know what? It's not the first well, time our neighbors said, "Oh yeah, we had to call the sheriff on him." He kept coming on to our land too. <laughs> okay. This is why Leo has that hat, Stacy. It, it, I guess it's so. going to intimidate people. I am ready. Where'd my hat go? Oh, here it is. Yeah. Let's try it this way. There's a new. There's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> Say hello to my nice. little friend Smith and Wesson. Um, what else? You said you had two things, Stace. Ma oh, that was the doorbell. The other one is, the, so the camera and the doorbell. The oh, the things. doorbell, yeah. We have the doorbell, too. Yeah. I um, like, I like, I, can show you. I like knowing what's going on. And it's not because we have any intruders. We're kind of in a, you know, it's a pretty quiet. That's Kravitz. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the we doorbell's real nice. It's got a nice field of view. It's, it's pretty it's wide. It's very tall. Yeah, yeah. So it gets a full, it gets the top of my head down to the packages, which is really nice. And it, the new setting that's new here is that it will tell you that, oh, I see a package. And then I'll get a notification. It's like, hey, the package has been removed. And then I'm like, oh, how did that happen? And then I go look at the, go to the, the tape. Atlantic, that we all won't go outside our homes anymore. And we just stare at each other with our cameras. Yeah. And it's safer that way. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Sundar Pichai was at the White House apparently today. Uh, uh, those words used to scare me, but this, no more. This just in, yeah. I think it's kind of a non-meeting just to talk about how we can make you know the cyber safer. I don't know how much Sundar has to say. He said apparently Google announced it's committing ten billion dollars over the next five years to strengthen and advance cybersecurity. Whatever that is, they spent a lot of money, I'm sure. Oh, no, no. Go read the book that I sent last week's recommendation. Once you read that, you'll be like, oh, shoot. We need to. Oh, I agree. <laughs> I'm not saying we don't need to. Oh, okay. I'm like, no, 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 like no, no, we should no, be no. having we these totally conversations at yeah. a lot of depth, actually. <laughs> I just I just don't know, you know, how much uh, these CEOs and President Biden are going to be able to do. But I guess committing $10 billion is probably... Uh, a good idea. They're going to expand zero trust programs, help secure the software supply chain. Very important. Enhancing open source security. They're also pledging through Google's career certificate program to train 100,000 Americans in fields like IT support and data analytics, including data privacy and security. So good. Good for Google for doing that. They've got the money. That's great. Um, Jeff, do you have a number? Yes, I do. So last week we talked about how Wendy's was opening up all of these uh, ghost kitchens yeah. and the power of real estate related to junk food goes away. Well, this week, my friend Rafael Ali Skiff reports that uh, among VC funded startups, um, there's a soaring cost, not of rent, but instead of Airbnb. As their leases are expiring, they're getting wow. rid of their office, and they're instead doing meetings, and they're spending money on travel. Wow. And, and, it's, and, and I think it was somebody, I forget who now, uh, argued that this is a um, portend of things to come. Real estate business, the disruption ain't over there, man. After after COVID, who would have thought and, that it wasn't we work that had capitalized on this, but Airbnb? Exactly what what, what Skiff says. Yes, yeah. you would have thought that would have been about the uh, the workspace, but no. Instead, they're going to save a fortune on rent. They're canceling leases. Why spend all that money? Yes, we'll get the team together and we'll make it fun. Actually, I hated those kinds of events. I yeah. hated things we had to be everybody at work, but that's fine. If they had a go. conference table on a little uh, Airbnb on the beach in Hawaii, I would probably be. Mm, more we did ours inclined. in Carmel, and that was very nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What do you mean we? Yeah, so Just you and Andrew had a, had a conference. No, 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 no. Like a giga home. <laughs> oh, giga home. Oh, yeah. Off when we did too. the we, we did the corporate retreats for like Fortune, they were just in New York and they sucked. Yeah, but oh, Mine's not a Carmel pick, but a nice. little bit of a warning. I remember when I was a little kid. 
I got lost in the woods. My sister and I got lost in the woods. We we got very thirsty and it was getting dark and we finally we found a house and we knocked on the door and we said, "Can help us? We're lost in the woods." And the lady pointed the phone. She said, "Yeah, you just go ahead and use the phone to call police." And I said, "What's the number?" She said, "Six seven four five." I thought, well, I've never heard of a four-digit phone number, but I guess it was a small town, and that's all you needed. I've always dialed seven digits, you know, three, 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 one, two, one, two. Well, pretty soon you're going to have to dial ten digits. Uh, in fact, you should start today getting used to it. FCC is announcing this, and it's kind of an interesting reason. They want to give the suicide prevention hotline a three-digit number, nine eight eight. Easy to remember, easy to connect, it will work everywhere. But as soon as you do that, it means that dialing an extension is going to be, you know, 988 and four digits is not going to work in a lot of areas. So beginning April 24th, it says you should begin to become accustomed to 10 digit dialing. Start dialing the area we were code. There for years, I thought we had to. Well, you I might know it's in because New York, you and I were to. in places that, yeah, because yeah, yeah. in Texas we oh, had I to as well. National. Oh, yeah, no. I've had it. No, it was New York. One, one, yeah, one, yeah. Right. yeah. In here in here in Petaluma, you could dial the seven digits. You'd get somebody even wow. on your cell phone. You oh. could. It worked and you fine. You got the party line too. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize you city slickers had it different. Yeah. However, yep. huh. you should start dialing ten digits because October twenty fourth. All consumers must dial 10 digits for all local calls. Uh, on and after this date, local calls dialed with only seven digits may not be completed. A recording will inform you your call cannot be completed as dialed. We've heard that. You have to hang up and dial again using the area code. And then the 988 number isn't going to actually be in effect till next year, July 16th, 2022. So, um, Is it possible to put things in your phone book with only the seven digits? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Because I was going to say, that means you have got to reprogram your contacts. Uh, for the that, contacts, I don't have that. Uh, you're right. Well, the other weird thing about this is that with everybody having cell phones and be, people moving around, area codes have been meaningless for a long time. Yeah. yeah. So now well, basically phone every phone number is a 10-digit number. Now, I don't know yeah. if this is everywhere. The FCC acts like it is. These are the 82 area codes that currently permit seven-digit dialing. But they also use 988 apparently as a central office code, and that's why they have to change. And so I see California 707 is in that. That's our area code. But, you know, many states. Welcome to the future. You guys have yeah. been dialing 10 digits all this time and you didn't tell me? Well, yeah. There you <laughs> I didn't know about this. I feel like this is going to be very poorly understood for it to show up in October 24th. Why haven't I not seen more it's stories? It's a public service announcement from Leo Laporte and the Twit Network. Good job, Leo. Yeehaw. <laughs> You're going <laughs> to... Yeehaw. So uh, Phoenix Warp 1 says, I never dial any more than seven numbers, and I live in New Jersey. Let me see if New Jersey's on the list. What? Yes, it is. In the what? 856 and 908 area code only, however. 908? That's mine. Well, guess what? You didn't have to dial 10 digits, but now you All do. All those wasted digits. All I those wasted, wasted digits. digits hey, years. thank God well, we got do, to push, I mean, push button dialing. You didn't have to go. That was slow. Sorry, Stace. Oh, no, I was going to say, if you tried to call anyone in New York, though, you would have had to do it regardless. That's right. 212-718 oh, yeah. or 781. Well, I'd actually, I think of myself as being in New York at all times. So. Right. Yeah. In New York, the area you, code's you, 516. You embody that. <laughs> he is a New York. Attitude, Stacey. He's a New York. I was going to say, you embody the New York mindset, Jeff. Don't worry. <laughs> pace, to, it, pace, what was that? Pace to taco sauce is... The, the guy, the cow. Oh, paste guys, picante sauce? Paste picante sauce. The guy's looking at the taco sauce and it says, it's made in New York City. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> Get a rope. <laughs> Get a rope. And of course, you know what that means. It's made by Jewish people. I think that's what he meant. Um, I always hear that when they say New York City. He's a little too New yeah. York. I always hear that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's a little too Jewish, really. Um, I should take this hat off. It's affecting me. Thank you, everybody. We're done. I wanted to thank just, you. I, I wanted to get to see my father. I got to do a whole show. Yeah. I'm, thank you very much. Why don't you have enough time to spend time with dad and the fam? 
Jeff uh, Jarvis is at buzzmachine.com, but he's really better known as the guy who Frank Sinatra called a bum. Uh, Bill Cosby, what did Bill Cosby call you? Um, uh, um, I don't. He, Ray Kroc called him a nickel millionaire. I know that. He was once um, asked to appear on the Oprah Winfrey show <laughs> and refused. And refused. Pissed off my publicist. <laughs> yeah. Why did you refuse? Because yeah. she wanted to brag about how she'd seen the light. And I argued that she had actually ruined daytime TV and turned it into trash <gasps> TV. And I wasn't going to be part of her. Oh, uh, wow. Bertie Jeff Bush Jarvis moment. called Oprah trash. Yeah, that's, that's the new headline. That's ballsy. I mean, <laughs> she's the goddess of the queen of television. She she trashed up TV, and then she and then she thought better of it. You give her that credit, but she was she was trying to claim. Um, she was like Andrew Carnegie, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah kind yeah. of re, re, refurbishing the old reputation. Oh, the hat's back yes. on. Oh dear. Uh, he's also, it just jumped on my head. I don't understand how. He's also the director of the Town Night Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the Craig Newmark Graduate Craig. School. Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. I just have decided not to do it without Aunt Pruitt it's covering me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. Have you been going back to uh, the city uh, to work? I've been in once, and I'm going. I'm teaching Monday. Nice. Yep. I love New York. I miss it. Uh, thank you, Stay. I also love thank the you. Pacific Northwest. You know, Lisa and I are thinking about moving, uh, as I told you, to Hat Island. That's why I got the hat. Oh, yeah, that's, that's right. That's Hat Island. Island. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Stacey. You get a boat and you can come visit me. <laughs> no, apparently the only way to get on or off Hat Island. Uh, Stacy yeah, or Higgins, plane. <laughs> or plane. Oh, maybe I'll get me a plane then. Uh, Stacy uh, is at StacyOnIoT.com. That's where you can subscribe to her newsletter. You can also uh, listen to her great podcast with Kevin Tofel called the IoT Podcast. Any events coming up soon? I was supposed to have it ready for today, but there is an event coming up on RF sensing, uh, future sensing things using RF technology. It will be September 21st. It nice. will be virtual, and it's going to be awesome. So if you go to Stacy on IoT.com, uh, it's not there yet, but it will be up there soon under the events tab, and you can uh, participate. And all your events are free, which is nice, right? It is. Except for the ones they you don't are. tell us about because they're not free. Yeah. Those are, those are called private parties. Private parties. <laughs> private parties. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We do This Week in Google on a Wednesday afternoon, right about 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. You can tune in and watch us uh, do it live at twit.tv slash live. Uh, you can also chat with us live if you're watching live at irc.twit.tv. Club Twit members get their own chat room. That it's easy to become a Club Twit member. All it takes is seven bucks a month. You get ad free versions of all of our shows, access to our Discord server, which is a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, you can also, uh, it, it really is cool with the animated GIFs and everything. And you can and also, Aunt Pruitt, Aunt, a new community the manager, Toastmaster. That's right. He's awesome. And uh, you can also get uh, the Twit Plus feed, which has all the stuff we thought was too controversial to cut out of the leaving the show and you get all of that because we trust you all of that at twit.tv I, mean, I can say dirty twit. words it will become a special you can say thing dirty for... words on the club oh, twit feed watch out <laughs> watch out editors I'm coming <laughs> one someday we'll just do a show on club twit it's just Jeff swearing <laughs> yeah out of, completely out of context just swearing up a storm That'd be good. I like it. <laughs> should, should, I, should I start right now? No. <laughs> no, not yet. We got to get the button ready. <laughs> that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not even at it. <laughs> if you really want to have some fun, uh, turn on the Samuel L. Jackson personality in your Amazon Echo. Uh, I think it's five bucks, but you can put it on all your Echoes once you do that. And then say, Samuel, why do you swear so much? <laughs> And he swears up a storm. It's good. We'll, we'll play it for you after uh, the show's over. Thanks, everybody. Have a great, have a great week. We'll see you next time on this week in Google. Bye bye. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, and I want to tell you about my show, Hands On Photography, here on Twit TV. Each and every week. 
Thursday, that is, I'd like to sit down and share with you the best tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer. And it's not always about Photoshop. It's not always about just having the biggest and baddest and bestest camera. It can be the simplest of things like leave your eye open when you're looking through the viewfinder. All of these simple tips can really help step your photography game up. So subscribe to the show today. That's twit.tv slash hop. And I look forward to talking to you soon.